And thank you for um, everyone in attendance tonight. I'm guessing we have an audience made up of students, parents, teachers, alums, and uh, other Mount Madonna School community members, as well as those joining us who found out about the event on social media um, or via Bookshop Santa Cruz, um, who has partnered with us to promote and make um, the books available for this event. And this is our final event in the spring SDG speaker series. Um, my name is Tiffany Wayne, and I'm a historian and an author and a former Mount Madonna High School history, government, and ninth grade English teacher. So I'm especially thrilled and honored to be asked to introduce our guest tonight, uh, Maria Devana Headley. Maria is the author of numerous novels for both adults and young adults, as well as a writer of short stories, essays, a nonfiction book, and an anthology editor and a writing teacher. In addition to another forthcoming novel already under contract and negotiating possible film rights for The Mare Wife, um, she's also at work writing a musical version of Virgil's ancient epic poem, The Aeneid. So stay tuned, uh, lovers of classical literature, there's more to come. Uh, tonight, Maria is joining us from the East Coast, uh, where it's much later already, so we appreciate um, her time and her energy for us. And she's going to read from and present on her newly published in 2020 translation of Beowulf. Uh, Maria brings a feminist perspective to this epic tale of the quest for power, a tale of war and violence, of masculinity and motherhood, of justice and revenge. Her modern language translation of Beowulf, um, side by side with the reworking of the story in a recent novel, The Mare Wife, uh, which is centered around a US military veteran and single mother attempting to protect her son from the brutalities and inequalities of modern suburban life. Uh, together, the translation and the modern reworking of Beowulf uh, take the story, the characters and the dilemmas of this 10th century or maybe even earlier in the oral tradition um, tale and drop it right into our 20th first century moment. Maria invites us to think about why and how these enduring cultural stories and myths still matter and opens up a space for us to discuss um, tonight and uh, continuing forward, how storytelling and how the study of the humanities uh, provides a moral and intellectual framework for thinking about social and economic problems. Uh, as Maria explains in her introduction, here I'm gonna uh, quote her, uh, Beowulf's story depicts edge times and border wars, colonialist impulses and kingdom building. In the world of the poem as today, again in Maria's words, uh, children are confiscated, refugees are imprisoned, the people doing the imprisoning claim that they're persecuting criminals, monsters, but some of those are infants and most of those are running from worse wars in their own homelands. The poem gives us examples of impervious masculinity and gender inequality, but there is also within this text, Maria notes, uh, female power, if one knows where to look for it. We might, writes Maria, if we analyze our own longstanding stories, use them to translate ourselves into a society in which hero making doesn't require monster killing, border closing, or horde clinging, but instead requires a more challenging task, taking responsibility for one another. After Maria's uh, reading, I will turn it over to the Mount Madonna School junior class to explore some of these questions in further conversation uh, with questions that they have created based on their reading um, and research into Maria's work. So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome uh, Maria Devana Headley and she is going to do a special reading for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me tonight. This is a pleasure to talk about these topics because the whole project that I've been working on, my whole career really, is um, breaking down notions of gender hierarchy and notions of tradition-based logic in terms of that, the idea that because things have always been this way, they have to be this way, um, is something that I've just been like trying to battle from my own story corner. And the this Beowulf project started about eight years ago, I'm gonna say, 
as I was watching the news and watching, you know, just thinking about the way that America is structured and the way that America has always sort of stepped upon its own citizens and uh, disavowed its its predation upon them. So I was, I was thinking about stories in which that sort of thing takes place. And I thought about Beowulf, which is a story about borders and difficulties over the borders, ideas that one side has power and the other side should not have power and, uh, and does not have power. Um, and I thought, well, I'll tell Beowulf uh, from the women's point of view. The women in the Beowulf story are in some cases not really named, like Grendel's mother is, has no name. Um, and she's one of the main villains of the poem, but she's really powerful and really interesting. So I thought, well, okay, what if I went into Grendel's mother and to the wife of the king, who is who is called Hrothgar, um, and look at the story from their perspective, look at the story from the perspective from which it's not being told in the poem. And that's how this novel came about. And then I, um, I wrote it, it came out in 2018. I thought I was done. Um, but I guess I wasn't done <laughs> because someone asked me in a, in a question and answer session after I gave a reading from the book, they said, well, when is your translation coming out? And I thought, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, but then I thought about it for a few days and started thinking about the ways in which bro culture is depicted within the Beowulf poem and the ways in which bro culture kind of runs American society and the ways in which the Beowulf story actually has partially built American society. So I started thinking about that and ended up doing this, um, which came out last year in 2020. So I'm going to read to you a little bit of my like deconstruction and reanalysis of gender roles in the Beowulf poem and in the Beowulf story um, from both of these, these books. And in, the, uh, in this book, there are many different POVs. There's a POV that is uh, the sort of women of this suburban community, which represents Hira Tall in the uh, in the poem, and the women are the soldiers of suburbia. So there's like a collective POV that's all of the all of the older women of this community. There's also um, a Grendel's mother POV, which is a first person POV. I'm going to read you a little section from the wealthy owl character, who's called Willa in this book, and her encounter with the Grendel's mother, his character, who is called Dana. And uh, Dana, the Grendel's mother character, has run through a Christmas party in suburbia. She, her son is in the house, has snuck into the house, her Grendel son, who's, you know, equivalent to the monster of the poem, but he's a little boy. And he's run into the house to play with his friend, who's the son of that house. So this starts right after she has left and the party has been disrupted. What happened? A crazy woman runs through a party and afterward everything feels wrong. The television ticks down the seconds in the year and the ball wobbles and the announcers grin and there's confetti. No one's watching, no one's kissing, no one's singing. Willa glances back toward the kitchen and the uneaten hors d'oeuvres. There's caviar, smoked salmon and blini all going to waste. That woman and her frightening face, her scars, her filth, unclean. Beneath her shirt, hardly hidden, was something Willa only saw as she left, a holster. And on her hip there was, Willa reconstructs it in her memory, a knife. Dylan, she calls, suddenly realizing she hasn't seen him in hours. She spins into the living room. Has anyone seen Dylan? She runs up the stairs and into Dylan's room, and there he is, toys all around him, his party suit looking worse for the wear. His hair is wet and his face is dirty. The room is a mess. It looks as though several people have been rummaging. All the drawers are open and Dill's backpack is out on the bed, half packed. Willa sees a loaf of bread, apples, cookies, cans of soup. Every book is off the shelves. Out of the corner of her eye, she catches a flicker of movement in the hall. She spins. Nothing there, paranoid. Adrenaline and champagne combined. She breathes twice, a mini meditation usually done with an app. What, Dylan asks, what, mommy? Dylan, Willa doesn't know what, she has no answer at all. Did you see that woman? She asks, was she in here with you? Gren wanted to sleep over. He forgot to ask his mommy, Dylan says. She got worried, it wasn't his fault. Willa is at the end of her patience for imaginary friends. She sees some crayon on the wall, red stripes, and she reads them, sidelong. 
Did you draw on the wall? She asks her son. No, he says, clearly lying. Gren did. Willa bends over the bed and looks out at the room. Her son is flushed. She puts a hand on his forehead. No more of this, Dylan, says Willa. No more Gren. Did you see anyone you don't know? Was she up here? She ran through the house. Yes, Dylan says patiently. She's Gren's mommy like you're my mommy. Roger's in the room. There's lipstick on the corner of his mouth. Willa notices the same shade of red as the crayon that's ruined the wallpaper. Everything okay up here, bud? Roger says in his trademark, jolly and aesthetic tone. Your grandma said you were outside in the snow. You know that's not allowed. Willa wonders how Roger can call a rabbit slayer bud. Has he forgotten? She's only just remembered about the rabbit, about the miserable next few months of therapists and family counselors making sure their son is not on a path to becoming a serial killer. But what if there's nothing to be done? And even as she sees it, even as she thinks it, she sees kicked under the bed, the black garbage bag, two limp ears, no eyes. She inhales raggedly and stands in front of it. She pokes it significantly with her toe to let Roger know what's here. What do you think she wanted? She asks Roger. Food, I imagine, says Roger, entirely too calmly, on the other side of several cocktails. She looked hungry. His bow tie is crooked. She was yelling for someone, Willa says, yelling a name over and over again. She didn't seem like she wanted food. Gren, Dylan says. Gren, Willa repeats, it's true. That's exactly what she was yelling. Willa thinks about the woman some more, diagramming her face, remembering the look the woman gave her, the way she stared into her eyes. She envied everything. The house, Roger, Dylan, the party. Where would someone like her come from? Not Herod Hall, no one like her lives here. It's fine, Wills, says Roger and turns to leave. Most of them are just mentally ill. Maybe the city put her on a bus and shipped her out for the holidays, keep the tourists from seeing her on the street. That happens. She had a knife and a gun, Willa blurts, her mouth getting the better of her. This brings Roger to attention. A gun? What kind? I don't know what kind, but a gun. She showed me, Willa says, and instantly regrets it. Roger turns red and white. His ears look frostbitten. A gun, Roger says. Are you sure? Willa isn't. Yes, she says. Better to be safe than. Is there someone in the hall? She's seen it again, a movement at the edge of the light. But no, she walks out and flips on the light beside the chandelier, nothing. The windows reflect her own self, her dress a void filled with sequined stars. I'm calling the police, Roger says, already dialing. It was probably a toy gun, says Willa. Once, years ago in the city, a kid pointed a gun at Willa. She was dialing 911 when he shot her in the center of the chest. For days after, she felt that icy water hitting her in the heart. She still feels it. She came into our home, Roger says. He was the rational one, but now he's switched. With a gun. No, that is a no. Willa's mother appears on the stairs holding something. It dangles from her fingers a necklace. Dog tags. These were in Dylan's room, Diane says. For the second time in a week, Willa opens the door to Officer Wolf. There are three more officers with him. Willa feels better already. This isn't supposed to happen here, Willa says. She might as well be back in the city, subway platforms and cat calls, dark hallways and elevator cages. Mysteries hidden in every stairwell. At least there she'd have been prepared for the intruder. It happens everywhere, ma'am, Officer Wolf replies. There are people lost in every city in America. It's our job to make sure they don't hurt anyone else. He looks into her eyes and she feels herself quiver, an arrow notched into a bow. He must be seven feet tall, muscles visible through his sleeves. Roger is only 5'11", and that's enough. It is, but she can't wear heels. Everyone here saw her. She nods. Give statements, he says to the other officers. The officers circle the room, viewing cell phone videos, taking notes. The party is improved. Willa makes the rounds, refilling champagne. Really, a neighbor says, don't you think we're overreacting? It's Louisa from three doors down. Willa discovers herself about to pour champagne into Louisa's plumped up cleavage. 
I know you'd be perfectly fine with guns and knives at your party, Willis says. I guess Roger and I are just sensitive. Of course not, says Louisa. I just wonder, I didn't see a gun. Do you think maybe you might have misinterpreted because Willa nearly crushes shrimp paste into her hair. She had a gun, says Willa, and walks away. It's not racist to think that someone with a missing eye and a long vine of scar down her cheek might be a dangerous person. Drugs, I imagine, says Tina to one of the other mothers. All I know is I'm glad she didn't do more damage than she did. Thank God nothing worse happened, says Willa. Have you tried the crab dip? Hell of a New Year's party, says one of the Marks. There are too many Marks at Herod and too many Sarahs and Matts and Michaels as well. Willa confuses them all with one another. Is this the Mark who's married to Louisa? He looks like he'd marry a woman with that nose turned up at the tip. Where's that from? To Herod Hall, to adventures. Happy New Year. Willa glances at the officers now talking among themselves. What is it, she asks. We've got a match. There's video, Officer Wolf says, but it's graphic. You might want to. He looks apologetically at Willa. I'll watch it, says Willa. None of the people in the living room bat an eyelash. They're watching the screen like they're watching a wedding. Normally the TV is used for football. The players skidding, skittering across it like living dolls, but now it's New Year's Eve and they're watching a woman on her knees. It's not her, Willa thinks at first, looking at the woman, the way she tilts into frame, her long, elegant throat, her muscles visible. She stares into the camera, her eyes so dark, there's no light in them, her cheekbones high. Can you identify her, Officer Wolf asks. This is Dana Mills. She grew up here in the old town. Is she the woman who was at Herod tonight? The woman looks straight out from the screen. She has two eyes, not one. America, this is your doing, the woman says, and then holds up a piece of paper on which is written the same thing in looping handwriting. Her voice is the familiar part, the part that makes Willa take a second look. You might want to send your little fellow out of the room, Officer Wolf says, pausing the video. Dylan is sitting in the middle of the floor. He's supposed to be in bed. Dilly, Willa says, upstairs now. He's fussing with something small and sharp, little plastic items and a rock from where Willa doesn't know. Willa's already stepped on one of the blocks the set bent to build the castle. Now she has to lug him up from the floor. She passes him to his grandmother despite Roger's look. Then lifts Dylan above her head with no effort at all. She's recently taken up boxing. I want to stay awake, Dylan cries, but up the stairs he goes. You can't always get what you want, Willa thinks, even you. The video moves again and the woman who ran through Willa's house turns her head slightly looking up at someone. Then a blade slices through the edge of the screen faster than Willa can see. There's a camera lurch, a blast and black. Willa retreats to the hall, nauseated, and hears some of the guests running out of the room, but her husband stays. I remember seeing that on Fox. I'm not convinced, Roger says. The woman we saw didn't look like her. Willa remembers this video. She never saw it when it was on the news, however many years ago that was. It feels like forever. There's some things a person never needs to see. It was released during those dark days, during a long war she'd forgotten was even still happening. Sometimes there'd be a major boss killed or caught and there'd be handheld cameras tilting into tunnels. It recharged the war, the beheading of a female soldier. Willa almost completely ceased watching television and skipped like a flat stone into another decade. She ventures back into the living room where Roger is sitting, Louisa standing behind him. He leans slightly back into breasts that give no territory to the hardness of his skull. On top of his head, there's a circle like Stonehenge. The white center, a place for sacrifices. Oh, Willa thinks, looking at Louisa's lipstick. Oh. She returns to the circle. Officer Wolf smiles sympathetically at her. Everything all right, ma'am? Call me Willa, of course, she says crisply. Roger doesn't even notice her speaking. His pulse is pounding in his neck. A second video is up, a woman walking down the steps of an airplane and onto the tarmac, soldiers all around her. She raises her head and there she is. Now with only one eye and scars down her face, that's her, Willa says. Everyone agrees, the whole room is murmuring. Are you certain, Officer Wolf says. He's, at, he's taking notes and looking only at Dana, or only at Willa. Corporal Dana Mills was in your kitchen. That's her, Roger says, talking over Willa. I should know, I gave her 20 bucks for food. Somehow Dylan's at Willa's feet again, not in his room at all, and she wonders how long he's been there, what he's seen. 
He looks delicate, but maybe a beheading wouldn't be too much for a child with no other experiences in his life thus far. He has no context for horror. There's a sound behind Willa in the hallway, something she can't translate, a creak on the floorboard, rattling a strange muffled sob of a noise. The hair stands up on the back of her neck and in the window she sees something reflected behind her, something from outside, something that she starts to turn and so do Ben Wolf and his officers. Dylan's looking over his shoulder, his eyes what? her shoulder, his eyes wide. Look, Dylan cries. He raises his hand and puts the head of one of the little Lego kings between his teeth. What is he doing? Even as Will is rising out of her chair, he swallows. The king's head lodges in Dylan's throat, his face turning red. A striped sweater, a glass of wine, Holy Palmer's kiss, the palm to throat, other palm to Dill's diaphragm. Willa lurches forward on her knees and pries open his mouth. He fights her for control, but she made this mouth. She made those teeth. Had he refused birth, he might have been found inside her years later, a tumor full of hair and fangs. A teratoma, her mind says, even as she bends him backwards and feels his fingernails scratching her hand. She persists. The urgency with which Willa shoves her hand in Dill's mouth past all the rows of secret teeth over, her over his tongue and into his throat impresses her from afar. She's a princess. She's a queen. She's a heroine. She locates the point of the crown with her fingertip and pushes it deeper into his throat, like she's pushing a toy train into a toy tunnel. Deeper, deeper into the dark. And now I'm going to read kind of the same scene, but in the poem itself, in this translation of the poem, which begins with the Willa character, who is Will Thao, um, giving a speech to Beowulf, who's come in as the sort of hero into Herod Hall um, to save everyone from, uh, I think he's actually just killed Grendel. So Grendel has just died and now Grendel's mother is about to arrive. The lady offered up all she had to trade. Accept this cup from me, my Lord of Rings, and lift this golden goblet. Give the Geats their due. Be good to them who've been good to you. Gifts are for granting and your hands should be open, your heart happy, even as you remember. I know you do. She's speaking to her husband, by the way. The good men who gave kith gifts to you. Curate's red walls have been whitewashed, purged of horror. And I hear you've chosen a brand new son, this cane cleansing warrior. I know, you know that life is short, that you are mortal. The blessings you bask in today are boons for bequeathing. I ask only that you gift the kingdom to your kin before your sword is sheathed in smoke. I know your nephew, Brothulf, well, his noble blood, his moral code, he'll serve our sons and treat them right. I trust he'll treat them sweetly if you should die before he does, repaying our kindness with son safety. We took him in when his father died, and if he recalls it at all, he knows how to behave. We gave the orphan everything, made him one of our brave men when he'd have been alone. She bent then to her boy's bench where Hrethic and Rothman sat with all the young sons of chieftains. There too was a grown man, good, great. Beowulf, the Geat, positioned between them. She brought him the cup. She called him friend. She gave him gold. Her will was wrought in rings. She offered armlets, garments, a neck ring, a collar larger than any I've ever seen, heavy as heaven is light, and all of it brighter and better than any horde since Hamas, who himself hooked the flaming throat chain of the Breesings, those amber god reins, and trekked it back to his own fortress, fleeing Ermenric's treachery and securing his soul with gold barter. And later, hear it, he, like the Geet, Swerting's nephew, would be the final owner. In his last battle, beneath banners, he'd hold to his horde, fighting furiously, shackled to this sparkling string, this precious, poisonous thing. Fate would fell him and his prideful priorities, the Frisians following his feud fuel, and he, in heavy armor, gem governed, would be slain. He'd worn that same sparkle when he crossed the sea coop, but even champagne goes flat. His bling would go to Frankish kings from plundered breastplate to that famous throat chain, and lowlier warriors would gloat over the goners, getting what gold they could get from geet corpses, a field full of the forgotten. 
the hall thundered with hand claps. Wilthia went on with her gift giving thus witnessed. Take this golden collar, dear Beowulf. May it keep your head on straight. Wear this mail shirt to a treasure of my people. May it protect your heart, Lord. Guide my two sons, guard them, keep them as they are tonight, and I will keep you as you are, draped in delights. You're famous here, and long after your lifetime, you'll be known, your story sweeping as the sea, shores born into being by waves of words. My prince, may you be blessed by this bounty. Keep my sons close. Treat them as we treat one another here in Europe, tenderly, trustingly, loyally. No one conspires to hurt, only to hold fast with brothers. Believe me, Beowulf, my thane's wishes align with mine. The sole desire of those drinking here is to do my bidding when it comes to you. She settled into her seat. Wine waterfalled into men's mouths. It was a banquet unmatched in munificence. After all, they had no foretelling of fate's fixed plans. A shadow stretched over sweetness, formless and fatal. Night fell and Hrothgar readied himself for rest, his quarters calling him to sleep. Men stood guard as they always had. The floor that bristled with benches became a swan road, white, ro white waves of bolster and feathers. And though one of those drinkers turned dreamers was doomed, he didn't know it yet. The Geats shields served as shining headboards and on each bench was arranged a helmet. Hulking, a mail shirt with rings like linked fingers and a splinterless spear, tree sleek, ready for wrath any time to be brought into play without notice, as was the habit of their homeland and war wanderings. They were ready, ready to wreak havoc any time, any place. Their lord was a lucky lord. The Geats were hardcore. But even Geats need sleep, so sleep slept, swept them away. One dreamer would die dreaming. This was nothing new, given Grendel's former residence in the Golden Hall, but his eviction had made evil dwindle in the minds of the defenders. That story, they thought, was over. There was another chapter. An Avenger lay in wait, counting sordid seconds until the latest hour, her heart full of hatred. Grendel's mother, warrior woman, outlaw, meditated on misery. She lived ill-fated, sinking beneath cold currents to her kingdom under country. Her line linked to extinction since Cain crossed swords with Abel and fled murder mark to make his home in wastelands, solitary and silent. From Cain came more misery, a legacy of lost souls. Grendel was one of those, banished and blasted. He'd found a waker among the dreamers, a battle amid the beds, and wrestled the warrior who'd woken into war. Beowulf saw himself as God's gift. Grendel is a goner. He used his strength to slay the intruder, trusting in his father to protect him, as he always had. He bled the hellion, and Grendel fled piecemeal. No heaven for him, no honey, only rushing through a haunted hall to die in his own mausoleum. And now his mother was here, carried on a wave of wrath, crazed with sorrow, looking for someone to slay, someone to pay in pain for her heart's loss. She found the path and made her way to hear it. Ring Danes were dreaming there, a murdering herd of sleepers, drooling drunk, their feast filling them. They were the cream of the crop, but soon they'd be chaff, scythed from swordsmen into skeletons. She was the one to do it. The horror wasn't muted by the measure of women's strength against men's brawn. Both can hold slaying swords glazed with gore and score the boar crests from war helmets, warming them with blood. In Girat Hall, hard honed blades were yanked from over benches, shields shouldered to cover blinking sleepers, waking bareheaded, bare chested, stunned by her arrival. She moved swiftly, knowing she had only moments to sift men for her vengeance and remain among the living. She tore a warrior from his bed and dragged him defenseless to her fen. This was Hrothgar's best friend, most adored on the land between the two salt seas, warrior and retainer. She slew him sleeping. Beowulf was lucky bedded elsewhere after the brawl gift quarters had been appointed him like rings. The Geat was asleep when Grendel's mother struck. Girat Hall howled, she'd taken their trophy to Grendel's hand. Man by man they squalled, this was unjust, a bad bargain that both sides should suffer losses, though the war was dealt and done themselves the clear winners. 
The wise king, gray and battle brittle, moaned when he knew the news that his closest advisor nearest to ear was no more, Dordale dead. Beowulf, blood blessed boy, was hauled from sleep, hustled, hung over to the king's bedside. Boot to boot with his band, he marched to the room where Hrothgar waited, grim and gloomy, wondering if his fate was fucked forever. The Almighty refusing to relent. Beowulf and his boys threw the doors open to sunlight and rattled the floorboards, no ground given to grief. Beowulf thundered up to the morose prince and asked, had Hrothgar slept well? Hrothgar had no words. He said some anyway. Don't speak to me of happiness. Hard times have come again. The Danes are in darkness. Escher is murdered, Jermenlof's big brother and my best friend. My battle broke when ranks were closing and Borhelms bashed into brain pans. He was there, hand to my heart, a man like no other, terror tested, never vested until tonight, when a slaughterer withdrew him and spirited him from Hurich. Where is she? Who knows? Glutting on gobbets after murdering him unopposed. This is on you. She threw herself into a blood feud after you slew her son Grendel last night, tore him and bore him into the afterlife. Never mind years of his own crimes. You gripped him, held him, and he lost the fight, fell to the mat, and died. He's followed by another now, an evil intruder, his mother, fueled by fury, a woman seeking vengeance for her son. She goes too far, even as a soldier might in avenging his king, grieving the loss of his ring giver. That hand which once stretched wide, filled with golden gifts, now still and cold. Well, I've heard my people, those simple citizens who live out in the muddy country, say they've seen those two together roaming the moor, wading the mere, heath rambling and of a height. One, as far as they can tell, a woman, and the other misshapen, formed like a man, but larger than any man has any right to be. He was named Grendel, a fatherless son. Who knows whether he had other kin? He was a sin walker, is all they said, those who've talked to me of these things. They say the two stalked the hillsides, the concealed country. They denned with wolves and dove in windy rivers, slipped like mist fist fish into the fen and down it, threw it down into the darkest places, underwater and underground cliff bound. It's not far from here, the mirror, but it's a world away. A forest frosted even in green months, old wood wicked and well rooted. Water reflects trees like tangled teeth, a gaping maw that at night is lit with flames in the flood. No one's ever touched the bottom. No one born of man anyway, men can't go in. Even animals, a heath hopping heart held to mirror's edge by hounds would sooner spin on hooves and fight, lower horns and ready itself for death, than step upon that sinking sod and dive into the dark. That is a bad place. Waves royal and taste the sky's edge, winds gust, clouds spit and spark, and when it storms, mirror mixes with mist, geysers up and heaven moans. I'll say it again, this is on you. Everything depends on a boy who knows nothing of this terror, not least what you might fear when you get there. The nerves that might make you quake in horror's homestead. Go in if you dare. I'll pay in gold, old and new, heirlooms and holdings lately wrought. If only you return having done it. And that's the end of the two sections sort of mostly overlapping um, that I'm going to read. And I think we, hopefully that gets to some of the, some of the things about gender that's, that are in this work, but I would love to hear your questions about what you want to talk about in regard to classics and gender and reimagining all those things. Thank you so much, Maria. That was awesome. That was a wonderful pairing of, um, of the two texts. And um, I think that uh, those of you listening, you can hear the beautiful words and cadence and language of Maria's writing in those two very different forms um, in, a, in a contemporary novel and in her translation of the poem. Um, and also hopefully, you know, see the, the layers and the overlapping stories of the, of the women and of the party scene, <laughs> right? So it's a great pairing of those two together and hopefully um, even if you haven't, in the, those of you in the audience, if you haven't had a chance to read either of those, um, gives you a great glimpse. So as mentioned, um, the Malmadonna students, the junior class here who's with us tonight, have been exploring the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And this is the first, uh, and they've had a whole speaker series this spring, which many of you have attended, I hope. 
And this is the first one where we're talking to an author, a novelist, someone in the humanities to kind of help us frame, um, well, the students have been trying to frame, you know, how that relates to um, contemporary goals, uh, global goals in gender equality. And also, as I was talking to the students a couple of weeks ago and um, kind of thinking about Maria's upcoming talk and about the story of Beowulf, we started thinking about um, another SDG goal, um, which is you know peace and justice and the role of institutions in global peace. Um, and I think all of those layers are in Maria's work. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, junior Jimmy Bregman to uh, introduce his class. And then I'll um, call on some of the students that have questions. Uh, hi, my name is Jimmy. Uh, thank you for taking the time to speak with us tonight. Uh, we're the junior class at Mount Madonna School. And as part of our values and world thought class, we've prepared some questions for you. Uh, thanks again for speaking with us about important issues, and we are really honored to have this opportunity. Thanks, Jimmy. And so um, I was going to ask uh, Liana if she wants to ask the first question. Awesome, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, classic foundational stories and myths uh, like Beowulf have a lasting impact on gender roles in society. Why do you think um, foundational stories and myths um, continue to impact the way we view gender roles in today's society, as well as relationships between masculinity and femininity? It's a good question. Um, well, one of the things that's interesting about sort of canonical texts, uh, and one of the reasons that I want to work with canonical texts, I guess, is that they are just by virtue of having been named important at some point, have been often the things that everybody reads. They're the things that have kind of shaped larger scale political decision making um, across the world in many cases. And so for me, like grabbing onto the Beowulf story, um, let me grab onto the ways that Americans have ex assessed powerful masculinity over the centuries. It's been, it's been kind of an important quote unquote text in American society um, or really in, in world discussions of literature for the past couple of hundred years. Before that, it, that was when it began to be translated into contemporary English. Um, and so people started to read it and think, ooh, this is how power was structured in um, the early English and Norse worlds, both of which are, they're different worlds, but this, this is an early English imagining of earlier Norse, Norse potentially folkloric elements. Um, so this, the ways in, that gender is depicted in this material is, um, is something that's, I think that people started to look at and think, oh, well, it's, it's always been this way. It's always been like male warriors. Now, that's a weirdness because over the course of translation of this text, the, um, the character that is the Grendel's mother character is referred to with a word that means warrior. But over 200 years of translation, she started being translated as monster instead of as a warrior which tells you some things about the ways that patriarchy started shaping women's capacity to be warrior um, and the ways in which sort of Victorian masculinity and specifically mas male translators um, started thinking, well, a woman wouldn't be a warrior. She, if a woman did what she does, that would only be a monster. It wouldn't be somebody who was a soldier. Like, and there are lots of men in the story who do things very similar to what she does and they're not monsters. Um, so this is, so, so kind of, I guess, thinking about what you're saying here, I think there's an opportunity looking at these older texts to um, sort of reanalyze them and think about how the ancient world was more complicated, was complicated, just in the same way that our world is complicated, that people do all kinds of things in our world in terms, and that gender doesn't necessarily dictate what you can and can't do. Um, as far as capacity is concerned, although society does dictate what you're allowed to do um, and can come at you if you're doing something that seems inappropriate um, as far as gender boundaries are concerned and as far as the uh, increasingly like redacted notion of what is what you're allowed to do as, as a woman or as a person, pretty much as anyone who's just not a straight man, basically. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I was interested in looking back and seeing if I could reanalyze some of that material uh, to get a wider expanse of identities in the, his, in the history, and then to bring that wider expanse of identities into our own understanding of the poem, and thus our own understanding of the ways that we have shaped our society um, 
around some of these epic notions of heroics. Great, thank you. You're welcome. That's a great insight. Um, and, and interesting, because you're not just analyzing the text, you're, you're trying to get through these layers of translation and how people at different times have translated mm -hmm. it um, in your role as a translator. Um, I did want to mention before I call the next student, um, if you're in the audience, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat at any time. And I will leave some time um, at the end, the last five minutes or so, to put it out if you want to ask a live question, I'll raise your hand. So um, if you have questions that come up, you're free to ask. So I wanted to turn it over to um, Ben uh, Pearson because he had a question about the novel. Hi, I'm Ben. Um, in The Mirror Wife, you made the protagonist an uh, Iraq war veteran. What were the intentions in doing so, and what do you hope for readers to learn and take away from it? Well, when I was thinking about the translation, as I just mentioned, about of um, Grendel's mother in the poem, I thought, well, what, what's the equivalent in our society now? And the equivalent would be a female soldier, <clears throat> and specifically a veteran who has been through some stuff. And so I made Dana Mills, who is the Grendel's mother character in The Mare Wife, a veteran who's really, really been through some stuff. And you heard a little bit about what she has gone through. Um, Grendel in the poem, we don't know who his father is. He, the father is never mentioned, not identified. Um, and, you know, I, I thought, well, that's, that's pretty potentially a traumatic event in, in the past of our character. So I made her a soldier, so a person with a lot of physical power and physical prowess, but a person in that war, um, which was a war that was a very troubled war, um, a troubled war in that we invaded Iraq for wrongfully. <laughs> and so a lot of the soldiers who went in were like, wait a minute, what are we doing here? This isn't, this isn't the right country. Um, so it was it was a fraught moment in the early aughts in America, like post 9-11, watching that war come into being. And women were just beginning to uh, be able to serve in sort of combat roles in that moment as well. So I was looking at stories from, from real women who served in that war and who were used as sort of propaganda materials. They were used both as like, these are powerful soldiers, but also these are potential victims of danger. And so there's a woman named Jessica Lynch, who was a really big um, media moment. She was, she was captured um, and, and rescued by American troops. And she was a soldier. Um, and she was, she was framed as a very heroic narrative, as someone who was really victimized. It was really horrible. Um, and heroic American soldiers went in and saved her. And it turns out that the, most of that story was imaginary. It was a propaganda that had, had been invented by the government um, in order to popularize the war and sort of reignite it and make, make people want to come in and save young women because she is a you know, pretty young woman. Um, so I used that to build the Dana Mills character and I used the notion of post-traumatic stress and post-combat stress um, to build her character as well, that she wants to keep her child safe from the world by hiding him away in a, in a mountain cave. Um, but that's also a pretty reasonable response if you're someone who's been a victim of American race hierarchy and American um, police violence and all of the kinds of violence that she experiences over the course of the book. So to hide your child away would be not unreasonable. And so her, her, um, her journey is, is ever, all of those things. It's a journey of a war veteran and of a, a victim of violence, extreme violence, and a victim of American military propaganda. And she's kind of all of those things, but all of those things exist. <laughs> I didn't really, I didn't make anything up there in terms of like what happened during that war to female soldiers, um, in terms of the way that they were used in that war to popularize the war amongst American civilians. Okay, um, yeah, this, there were a few questions about that kind of um, angle of, um, I mean, that's one of the main themes of your work of, of powerful women and also, you know, I'm glad Ben brought up the question of making her a veteran of a recent war. Um, and so kind of continuing along that line, um, Grace had a question about how that works into like storytelling with the hero's journey, I think. Hi there. Um, 
Okay, so it is said that the heroine's journey is centered on moving forward with the female trying to bridge the gap between both the male and female roles, while the hero's journey is often much more about the hero's personal glory and achieving victory in the end. So my question is, how do you think this difference has affected our perception of gender roles? Ooh, ooh, big question. Let me think about that. Um, well, you know, sort of the notion that a woman's role would be to do everything and that she would not be able to help it, that she would have to do all of the emotional labor as well as the physical labor of um, remedying conflict. And that conflict, that even just undergoing conflict is a heroic path for a man, um, is something that we see that all the time in our society. We see, we see the idea that if a man has been through something that he is inherently heroic. And I'm thinking about, um, well, I could think about lots of things, but lots of things that, that then later justify uh, overreaction and potential violence, violent reactions that are not justified, and especially if we're talking about, um, in, in my book, Ben, the Beowulf character is a police officer, and that's why, <laughs> um, because he's been through things, so his overreactions are totally justified, um, and his, his notions of that everything is a heroic path or justified. So I think that um, women have a harder time getting to that notion and even to any notion of ever being a hero in our society. So it's, and not, not just women, non-binary people, trans people, it's, um, it's something that the idea of being a hero uh, for anyone who isn't just a cis man is not part of the cultural mythology. So, um, you know, I mean, I'm always, I'm always looking and digging around, looking for stories that depict things differently. And if they don't, I'm looking underneath those stories to see what I can find um, to create pathways for different mythology and, and pathways for different sort of aspirational notion of, of getting to uh, not necessarily like full society heroics, I guess, but but personal heroics to feeling feeling heroic and and not just for um, not just for having experienced things, but also for doing things that are that are heroic. Because people do heroic things all the time, and they're not recognized for them. And um, and in terms of gender stuff, that's just kind of across the board something that has happened throughout thousands of years of of mythology and myth making about who gets to be the hero of a story. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the, the sort of conflict resolving peace weaver stuff is all throughout Beowulf and it's all, it's, there's usually a female peace weaver running through um, many stories, even if peace weaver isn't a concept from the culture, the idea that a woman is the bridge um, is something that's longstanding. And the idea that a woman is a bridge because she can't help it, that's just part of what she inherently is, is something that's run through society for thousands of years. Um, and you know, that's, a, that's a pretty, that's not the only path. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm always looking to find examples of other, other versions of that, of gender identity for everybody. Great. I think that's a great response Thank and you. a really interesting question. Oh, sorry, Grace, <laughs> jumping in with my thanks. Um, it was an interesting question about heroes versus heroines and, and also the notion of victory, like what is victory, who wins? Mm -hmm. And, um, in the tales and in your updated version. Um, okay, I wanted to um, jump to uh, Ben G now. Um, he has another question um, about art. Hi, I'm, I'm Ben. Um, <laughs> so I, as you know, I think you mentioned when we were in the green room that you know uh, Molly Crabapple. Um, so <laughs> In our recent interview with writer and artist Molly Crabapple, she stressed the importance of separating art from the artist. What do you think about this idea? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I think I'm pretty reasonable in, in many ways because I, um, 
the notion for writers is that everything is autobiographical, <laughs> that everything you've written is because you are it and because it has happened to you or in some way, it's something that's, that's been part of your existence. And that's of course not necessarily the case. Like a lot of a lot of what I've written is stuff I totally made up and, and I made up, I imagined myself into other identities in order to write it, which I think is something that's pretty crucial, but also sometimes it's problematic. You know, you end up imagining yourself into another identity and getting it really wrong. And, you know, it's the walking the line of, of trying not to uh, encroach upon someone else's identity in a toxic way is, is a hard journey. And it's, a, it's something you have to think about all the time. It's something I think about all the time because I don't want to be like climbing into someone's story and and getting it terribly terribly wrong being misguided as I try to do something that's theoretically useful um so the separation of of I mean I don't even on the one hand as I'm living it I don't know how to separate separate myself from what I make because what I make is because of my own passion and it's because of passions that came into me because partially because of who I am and the kind of identity I've had as a person but on the other hand, I mean, depends on what she was talking about, and I don't know because I wasn't there for that lecture. Um, lots of examples of like art that was created by people who are questionable people in their in their daily, <laughs> and who are in in some cases currently. Um, and maybe the art was world changing nonetheless. And I mean, you know, I, I I think I fall on every side of this notion. I think about it lots of different ways. There there are some artists whose work I kind of don't wish to engage with, but it's not necessarily because of what they've done in their personal lives. It's often because of what's in the work. And sometimes the same things are in the work that are in their personal lives or that are in their public personal lives. Um, the same like questionable, questionable sexist stuff, which is usually what it is. Um, so I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, I definitely fall on every side of this and it's a, on a case by case basis, but the, you know, I, I think about I think about work by people who are like spectacularly famously bad people, like Hitler, the the king of the bad. Um, you know, he was also a painter, and his in his youth he was like, I want to be a painter. I want to make beautiful art, and he did not like his art is not it's not beautiful, but it exists. I mean, and it does not show the entirety of. The Hitler stuff. I mean, it doesn't look like that. It just looks like some bad little paintings by paint by number kind of paintings. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's a different thing than the, you know, the art and the artist are two different things in that case. And neither one of them are good, but they're bad in different ways, you know, like bad and, um, you know, the artist is bad in the way of like a, a beginner art class where somebody felt passionate, but had no skill. <laughs> And the person was bad in the most spectacular and epic way. Um, and, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I just, I think about all of those things sometimes when I'm like every, every little bit of everything is very important and very entwined with, with every bit of living. And I think everything is possible, you know, but I guess like all my work is about that. All my work is about everything being possible, about every kind of person being possible, about every kind of whether good or bad, you know, and I, I think about that all the time. I think about you know, no one, no one really thinks of themselves as the villain of their story. Everybody thinks of themselves as the hero of their own story. And I, I think in terms of the like art and artist being separate, it's the same thing. Everybody's, you know, working their like strange, strange and peculiar and quirky journey as the hero of their own story, creator of their own art, maker of their own wild imagined spectacular stretches. Thank you. It was a great question, and we've um, and, and the response we've we've had that discussion in you know in talking about uh, works to read in English class, you know, mm -hmm. and in even in talking about historical figures who contributed something important to society, but maybe uh, when you actually find out about them as a person, it's problematic. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, we have a few more minutes left, and so um, I want to shift and. Uh, you know, put it out to the general audience to make sure if anyone has any uh, questions that they get a chance to uh, do that. So if you want to put a question in chat or if you want to raise your virtual hand under reactions or raise your actual hand, um, we'll be looking out for you um, if anyone wants to ask a live question. 
So does anybody in our um, audience have any questions they want to ask Maria? You can also ask about anything else that is in these books. If you yeah, have that's what I was going to say. I was going to say about the, yeah, about the exactly. books, about her creative process. So uh, you uh, grew up in, I think, even more rural area than I did. <laughs> and so it was probably, I'm guessing it was a relatively right-wing society that you were raised in. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever wonder where your, do you know where your perspective like this came from? I, I grew up in a tiny <laughs> town like that too. And, and sometimes I wonder where my desire to leave there and explore other things came from because, you know, most of my class didn't leave. Like, do you have to, is, was your upbringing similar? Where you're like, what, where'd, where'd that idea come from? <laughs> Well, I grew up in like really rural farmland in Idaho. I grew up um, in southern in southern Idaho, and surround the place I'm from is really full of a lot of different kinds of fundamentalists, um, all different across the spectrum, though. Like not just not just one kind, but like five. And uh, and Idaho in the early '80s when I was growing up there was um, was a purple state. It was it had a, a Democrat as the governor and a, like pretty hardcore environmentalist Democrat as a governor. So it was like an interesting place to grow up because people really cared about the natural world, but also had what look, it would look now like pretty far right ideals. And that's, you know, the, the, the far, like the, the Aryan nations was living, was in Idaho during my, my childhood and teenage years. So I was, I was thinking a lot about like extremist politics, I guess, as a, as a teenager and as a kid, because they were all around me and people were, nobody was like middle ground, you know, it was like, it was like edge, everybody was edge, but there are also like a lot of like kind of former commune dwelling sort of far left hippies in Idaho um, who had come out of the seventies looking for the beautiful landscape and ended up in Idaho. So it's a, uh, it was just a mixed bag of identities and often kind of crossing, cross pollinating because like the edge is a skinny little edge and like far right, far left. If you go to the very edge, you look kind of similar. <laughs> and so I don't know, I'm not sure where um, my personal political identity came. It did come out of that. I mean, I came out of it going, well, there are the edges and I'm, you know, I'm interested in equality. So like the edges were less interested in equality than I am. And that's maybe where this happened. I, I started I started like shaping my my notions of the kinds of stories I wanted to tell. And I was a writer the whole time. Like I was always, I was always telling stories. I just got lucky and I get to be one of those people that gets to like tell stories to a larger group of people than might have seemed likely from the like 500 person town I grew up in. But that 500 person town suffered my childhood of me telling stories to that 500 person town. <laughs> um, you know, but the other thing I learned about growing up in a place like that is that even though I definitely probably always have been to the pretty far left of most of the people that I grew up around, stories are stories like you can you can make a path with story that you can't necessarily make with um just basic discussion like if you tell a story you can reach deeper and i and that's where that's where this came from that's the idea that if i could if i could get if i could get into people's hearts and brains that way by by telling it something that would lead them there rather than being like these are this is my soapbox <laughs> And you know, I mean, I have a soapbox. I carry that around with me, <laughs> but it's uh, not always the best use of time. It doesn't always work. And one of the things I learned about growing up in a place like that was that the story is going to get you deeper. And um, yeah, and so I like to think about storytelling that way because storytelling has always been that. That's what it's been throughout the history of humans. It's a tool to get deeper, in whatever direction. <laughs> not necessarily always a good one, but. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, I think that's what my upbringing left me with in terms of storytelling and in terms of political identity as well. It's a great way to think about it. Uh, anybody else have any questions before we let uh, Maria go to sleep on the East Coast? <laughs> want to respect her time, but um, I also, I also just want to appreciate and or tell the students that I appreciate that they had many more questions. 
um, that they came up with in their discussions. Um, and so I appreciate your work, uh, students, in grappling with these issues. And I hope you, after hearing Maria speak, you can follow up and um, think about um, how your questions fit in and talk about it more in class. Any other audience um, member questions? Blythe, you have a question that looks like. I do, and I don't want to take too much of your time, so it's okay. I, the answer is brief, but I was really curious when you were talking about um, kind of the idea of climbing into someone else's story, and um, then in the more recent answer, you were talking about um, people of very different experiences and perspectives. Um, and you spoke about, you know, people are always the hero of their own story. They're not the villain in their own story. And I'm curious um, if you've ever kind of climbed into someone's mind when you're writing about a character from a perspective that's different from your own and what you've learned from that, if so. Yeah, it happens to me all the time. <laughs> I, not, to, not that I always like it. Sometimes I'm like, oh no. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, I tend to do this kind of probably sounds sort of woo, -woo but like my my process when I'm writing is is often to just like let the character talk and see if I can and just type as fast as I can and not judge when I'm writing for a while just to see what the character wants to tell me. Um, and sometimes the character is super questionable, like that section that I read from the mirror wife where Willa her son had is like distracting the room by swallowing the head of a lego king and she pokes it down his throat um you know it's not what i thought she was going to do i thought she was going to snatch it out of his throat and be heroic in the room and save her son and instead she tries to kill him and i was not expecting her to do that i didn't know how angry she was and i discovered how mad she was as i was working on this book um because i was thinking as i was working on it i was writing about um the different kinds of cages that a woman could be in, the different kinds of captivity a woman could be in. And she's in a very privileged captivity. She's, she's got, you know, she's the queen of the suburbs. She's the queen of a gated community, but she is trapped and she is unhappy and angry. And I, I was writing this in 2016, like right after the election. And I was looking at the ways, looking at the number of white women who really privileged white women in many cases who voted for Trump. And I thought, why did they do that? Why did they want to keep that same level of captivity? Why did they want to keep themselves underneath someone? And it just looked better. It looked, I mean, I assume that's what I was exploring with that character and with the women in this book who do that thing, who keep defending patriarchy, who keep saying, no, the man will save us. But really they're like running things from behind the scenes and trying to like navigate around a big blockade of power that's on top of them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I was surprised to have that happen. And, and sometimes when when someone does something really awful, I'm surprised, or you know, I have trouble historically killing characters that don't deserve, you know, even if I know I have to kill them. And in this story, I had to kill some people that I didn't really want to kill, but the story is Beowulf and kind of everybody dies. So it had to be like that. Um, but I just didn't want to do it, you know, and I I discovered. I had some workarounds, but I also had to justify all of that killing had to be justified by the people who did the killing. And I, and that's sometimes the hardest part for me because I can't imagine just why you would justify that, how you could justify it. So, but you know, maybe that's why I'm a writer. I am, you know, I'm always trying to imagine why people do the things they do, the horrible and the wonderful things they do. And Sometimes when I just let a character talk to me, I, I get some answers to, to the why of it and to what, what people might be thinking when they do something that to me seems like, you know, completely alien. And, you know, I mean, I'm always digging to see, to find the alien possibilities, I guess, because I'm interested in them. In them. I'm interested in the ways in which we, we justify world changing and world shifting choices. Um, it, it, the huge ones and also the small ones, the little ones that we make in our daily lives to support fascists, for example. You know, why would we, how do we justify that? I want to explore and get in and see what, what fuels that, that choice and what justifies it so that we can still think to ourselves, I'm a hero. 
you know, because if we can't answer those questions, we can never change. So I'm always looking at the, I'm always looking at the bad, dark questions, I guess, but also sometimes at the brave moments of bravery, when people get, do something really brave and you wouldn't expect that person to do something really brave and they do, you know, I'm interested in those choices too. So I'm, it's a sort of, you know, weighing the, weighing the bleakness in my books and the joy. Sometimes there's like, joy and love in them too. And this, this book has both of those things as does Beowulf, you know? I mean, they kind of all, all stories do. They, they, have, they have beauty and love and also catastrophe and terrible choices. Otherwise there's no story, I guess. And no, no existence as humans, I also. <laughs> Thanks Maria, that, that's a great place to end our conversation. Cause as you were talking about being a writer and trying to get into the head and understand um, what your characters are doing and their mo their motivations and their justifications and understand their perspective that's what we're trying to do as humanists i mean that's what we're trying to do in terms of you know building empathy and understanding um, people's perspectives who are differently situated in our own country in our own communities but people who live in other regions and other cultures as well so that's, um, you connected it very well for us for the kinds of conversations that the students have been having. So I think that's going to um, end our um, conversation and I wanted to thank everyone for uh, coming. I would invite you to the next speaker series, but this is the last one for um, our school year. So it's a wonderful way uh, to end. Um, and again, I wanna thank our um, partnership with Bookshop Santa Cruz and our other sponsors um, for the event and uh, those of you who might be here and are interested in uh, Mount Madonna School can find out more about the school and ways to um, get involved and support the school um, through our website. And so um, thank you. A lot of people in the chat are saying thank you. It was a wonderful conversation. And um, I don't know um, if, uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm uh, ending it or if uh, Anne wanted to say anything else or... <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to thank everybody so much for coming to the series and we look forward to starting the series again up next year in the fall. Um, and so again, we'll have our junior oh, nice. senior class um, moderating these events and uh, we look forward to another round. And we really wanna thank Maria for coming this evening and for speaking and sharing her talents with us and her perspective and um, on her creative craft. And uh, we've had a really, really lovely night. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Everyone have a wonderful evening. We'll see you soon.